Thank you for all coming and thank you for inviting me. Um, you can hear my voice is horrible at the moment. Uh, that's become because I officially got ill yesterday. But, uh, well, I hope uh, my uh, voice will hold uh, at least till this evening when there is another lecture by me. Um, it's okay with me if you ask uh, questions in between. So if something is unclear or you think this is stupid or whatever, just uh, react and uh, we will see how to cope with it. Uh, I can't answer all questions, but uh, we'll see how far we'll get. Uh, I got about uh, 30 slides about our research that indeed started in 2013. So we're now busy over just over five years. And uh, what you see outside is a kind of, uh, in the library, is a kind of representation of our first research. But I've got some pictures of that research as well. And indeed, uh, we got some money also to our surprise for the first project. It was 25,000 euros, not much. Uh, we overdid the budget um, a little bit by a factor two, something like that. But nobody cared, so I was quite happy. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, if we can grow plants on Mars or on the Moon. Because um, I'm convinced that in s at some point in time we will have a colony both on the Moon and on Mars. And if you go over there, it doesn't make sense every time to ship in new food. That's costly. Uh, especially to Mars, it's also dangerous if you have to send your food every time. I uh, don't know who saw the movie The Martian? Yeah, some people. I thought so. Yes, me too. I like it. Uh, for several reasons. Uh, there are also a lot of things not correct in that movie, but growing crops is quite good. Um, but you can see, even in that movie, it's dangerous. Um, so if something goes wrong, you immediately have a problem. That's why we think if you go over there, you have to grow your food, your own food, at the site. Otherwise, it won't be possible, both on the Moon and on Mars. And that's what we're researching, how to get that going. First, a bit about the Moon. Um, it's not that far away, almost 400,000 kilometers. There's no air there. Um, gravity is one-sixth of the Earth. And that's already a thing. Of course, no air is also a problem for plants because they cannot grow if there is no air. But I've got a solution for that. Um, One-sixth gravity. We don't know what will happen to plant growth if you have one-sixth of the Earth gravity. We do know what happens in the ISS. Uh, and we've already learned from Skylab what plants do if there is no gravity. But we don't know if it is less. So we either know at one or if there is not. Um, did anyone ever see what uh, the plants did in Skylab? Yeah, that was the first experiment they did. Yes, yes, that was very funny to see. I th still think that's very nice, and you can learn a lot from that. Um, plants detect gravity. Uh, they know where is up and where is below because of the gravity. So they know that the root has to grow downwards into the soil and the leaves and the stem have to grow upwards. That's based on gravity. On the ISS there was no gravity. Uh, uh, on Skylab as well there was no gravity. So what they did, they put the seeds in there. It was aeroponics. So they just uh, put some uh, air uh, and uh, some uh, water with nutrients in it, and they sprayed it with it. And what you saw was that plants, that the roots, the leaves, and the stems were just growing into each other and through each other. So the plant totally didn't know what to do. And that was because either they did not give light, or they gave light from every direction. And the second way plants know where to grow is light. They know that if they have one source of light, where is up, because there the uh, leaves have to grow towards, and the other side, the roots have to grow towards. So now on the ISS, we know that. We didn't know that back then, so that was new. On the ISS, it goes perfectly well, and plants grow in the correct direction. Um, but gravity, one-sixth, we don't know. And, of course, a major problem uh, the moon, 
Uh, we, we have uh, days of 24 hours. Uh, the moon day is, uh, well, about 26 days, which means that it is about 13 days of light, 13 days of daylight, but it's also 13 days dark. And that's a bit of a problem for plant species. They probably will not survive in that. Um, so, no plant growth on the surface. I'm not aiming for that. Um, I think important also for today, I put it in, there is no life on the moon, we're quite sure of that. Still remains the question, if we can put life on the, on the moon, is that allowed? Well, I don't know if anyone went yesterday to the lecture, that was about space, uh, space law. Officially, that's not allowed. So what I want is officially not allowed. But it's actually not a law, it's an agreement with the countries that are part of the United Nations that you should not bring any living thing towards another celestial body. So not to the moon, not to Mars, not to Europe, uh, or to Pluto, or even beyond that. So, also for me that's a problem, because I want to bacte bring bacteria as well, not, not alone plants. Um, on the other hand, uh, Neil Armstrong went to the moon. I think he's a living thing, or at least he was. Uh, moreover, uh, and not many people know that, but there is an official monument now uh, for the state of California on the moon because they want to protect the sites. And what is also now an official monument is the poo of the astronauts, because they left that behind. They didn't take it back to Earth. And, well, there are a lot of bacteria in the poo, also of astronauts. So, officially it's not allowed, but there are already bacteria there. So, yeah, what to do. Um, there is moon soil on Earth. I want to grow plants in it, but I cannot get it. It's way too expensive and NASA is never ever going to give it to me because when I do experiments with it, I change the soil. They cannot do measurements on it anymore. So there's no way you can do that. There is actually uh, some other stones on, of the moon also on Earth. I've got one here with me. It's a real moonstone. It comes from a meteorite. So it was once part of the moon and it somehow came to Earth uh, and came here as a meteorite. In principle, you could say I could use this, but the problem is it traveled through space, it burned up in the atmosphere, so it totally changed. So it's not comparable anymore with the moon. So I cannot use this. Bit of a problem. Then Mars, a bit farther away. Uh, the moon is about two days' flight. Mars is about six to nine months. So, totally different time period. Uh, this distance is much, much farther away and it varies from 60 to 380 million kilometers. Um, gravity also lower, one third of Earth. Still that question. There's almost no air. There is some air on Mars, but it's about the same as if you were 30,000 meters above Earth. So, it's not much. Not enough to grow plants in. Uh, very convenient for me, the Mars day is about 24 hours and 36 minutes. That's almost the same. I think plants will be able to cope with it, if they had to. Then the big question is, is there life on Mars? Maybe tonight we will hear, hear more about that, because there will be a big press conference of NASA. I don't know what they're going to say. I don't think it's going to be about life, but about f liquid water. Uh, but, well, we'll have to uh, hear what it is. But um, this, of course, is a big question. If there still is life on Mars, are we allowed to go there and bring our own life to contaminate the planet? If there is no life anymore, which I think is the case, at least till tonight. Um, uh, was there life in the past? And can we go there then with our bacteria? Uh, 
or will we contaminate Mars with our DNA, with our bacteria, making it difficult to see if we have real Martian life from the past of our own, what we brought. Right? That's something to think about. And connected to that is, of course, the question, can we go there and live there? Uh, some people argue, and I've heard it several times already, uh, well, we already fucked up Earth, should we fuck up Mars as well? I get emails with those exact content. So, hey, that's a big question. Well, uh, since I want to grow plants, you can imagine what, how I think about it. But it's something, is that something scientists have to decide? Have we to, to go because we can? Or are there other things involved? And should maybe the whole population of Earth decide on that? I don't know, but I know what's going to happen. We will just go. And if there is no discussion, it will just happen. Uh, there's also known a lot of information about the soil on Mars, what I want to use for plant growth. Uh, this is a selfie taken. Anyone knows how, how he did that? Anyone? Because you don't see a camera. Where's the camera? No. No, what NASA did is they took f several photos and they composed it together and um, made it to one photo and they photoshopped out the camera. But you don't see a camera on this. And for some people this is reason to say that there is no real camera on Mars because uh, you don't see a camera. Um, the same as for uh, Moon g also applies for Mars. Uh, here I got a very small part of a Mars meteorite. Again, there is some on Earth. This is the only thing we've got on Earth because never ever came one of those rovers back to Earth to bring some soil. That didn't happen yet. This is available. But again, this is so changed that I cannot use it. But we've got a lot of data from the rovers and from remote sensing by satellites, but also from Earth about the composition of Martian soil. And NASA solved this problem, not to grow plants in, but to test. Um, and that's what I'm using. I got it here. This is the moon soil simulant I use. So it's not a real moon soil, but it's not, well, it's not perfectly, but almost the same as what you would find on the moon. That is what we use to test plant growth. The same applies for Mars. Looks a bit like this. This comes from a volcano from Hawaii, which makes sense because there are large volcanoes on Mars. So the soil is almost the same. This comes from an Arizonian desert. Often people ask me, well, you're doing nice research, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, and a lot of people like it, but uh, is it any good for Earth? Well, uh, and I don't know if it should be good for Earth, but yes, it is, because this comes from a desert, this comes from a volcano, both no plant growth, but we are learning by growing crops on these soils how to grow crops. There's also learning how to grow crops on soils that are available on Earth and where nothing is growing at the moment. So if we can do this on this soil, we can maybe also apply that on deserts on Earth. And well, we're going to be with 10 billion people, is the prediction. I don't like it, but it's going to happen, it seems. And we have to feed all those people. So it may become extremely important to get our uh, deserts fertile again, and then this will help as well. In our second experiment, we also worked with Sahara sand just to look at that. And in our last experiment, we had sand from another desert also to look if we can restart the desert and get plant growth going again. Apparently, if you do space research, there always has to be a justification for that, that you can do something with that on Earth as well, somehow. Okay, back to Mars. Um, in the marsh, you saw people living in a kind of tent. I'm quite sure that's not going to happen. In that you see it more in science fiction movies, and you see it even on uh, 
uh, maquettes. That's not going to happen because another problem on Mars is the cosmic radiation. You probably heard of solar flares. They can be very devastating. They even influence what's happening on Earth. You can see it uh, in the northern sky uh, when it lights up. That is cosmic radiation that is blocked by the magnetic field and by the ozone layer on Earth. But Mars doesn't have a magnetic field and it doesn't have an ozone layer. So cosmic radiation ends up on the soil surface, killing everything. My plants cannot uh, survive that. People cannot survive that. Even if they're suited up, they cannot stay very long for a very long period outside. So the solution is either this or go living in a cave. That's also a possibility. But it's going to be below ground, under at least one meter of soil, to protect you. And that may seem inconvenient, but for me it's very, very easy then. Because I will do agriculture indoors. It looks like city agriculture, where you have total control about, uh, about everything. And it makes life a lot easier. And on Mars, well, I think there is no life, so we have no bacteria there, no diseases. So we have to keep it that way. But that makes it a lot easier. I can grow potatoes on the same soil as long as I want. No diseases. So indoors, below ground, LED lights to light them. Normal air pressure with normal air in it. So the astronauts can breathe in there, but the plants can grow in there as well. So <laughs> a tent where you live in, not going to happen because you will die. Even my plants. Sorry, Mark Watney. Um, solar panels. Some people think we should bring nuclear power uh, to Mars and also to the moon. I'm not quite sure about it. But uh, I know people uh, a few hundred meters in the uh, that direction where uh, uh, the nuclear power plant is. I work together with them on research. They are very in favor of it because they say you can never do it with uh, LEDs alone and with solar panels. But that's a discussion as well. Should we bring something dangerous like that to Mars? So indoors. Now to our first experiment, and you can see here already a, a picture of it. Uh, Mars, Moon, Sol semblance from NASA. It's not for free because 100 kilos cost two and a half thousand euros. It's a bit more expensive than 100 kilos of potting soil from your garden center. Um, in a normal greenhouse, earth air, no manure added in that first experiment uh, because I wanted to know what is possible in that soil. And I knew, because I did analysis, that that soil is quite okay. There are two problems. They don't contain much nitrate. Nitrate uh, is the most uh, important nutritious uh, nutrient for plant species to grow on. And on the moon soil, there's a lot of aluminium in the soil, and that's toxic. Even toxic for plants. It's also toxic for humans, but plants will die. We know there are a lot of heavy metals in the soil as well. Plants don't have a problem with that. They just grow. They don't bother if there is zinc in it or lead or cadmium. For us, of course, that's different. Um, I had 14 plant species. I had crops, of course, you want to eat them. But I also had clovers and I had wild plants. Wild plants because I knew the circumstances would be tough where they were growing in. These are not the best soils you can find. If you add water to it, it stands just on top. It's very hydrophobic, so it takes a while to sip in. Uh, that's already a problem. In that ex first experiment, we had to water the plants twice a day, and that was not even enough. And it was weather like this. <laughs> so it was quite warm. It was a lot of work. So I knew it would be tough, so I took some plants from the wild, from the dune area, where they can live under very similar, very difficult circumstances in sandy soil, drought, so no problem. I thought maybe they will germinate. And the clovers, I don't know if you know, but uh, they can, together with bacteria, take nitrogen, N2, out of the air and turn it into nitrate and share that. So they live in symbiosis with the roots of the plants, share it 
with the clover so the clovers can grow. So in that way I can manure the soil. That's why. Oh yeah. Uh, we had 840 pots, that's even more than there here outside. We had five seeds per pot, so we had 4,200 seeds. Why so many? I had 20, 20 replicas. Why so many? Because normally you don't do that. But, well, tough soils, so I thought maybe if I take 100 seeds of each species, maybe some will germinate. Then I have something to measure. Yeah, well... Um, that turned out to be a bit of a problem. Um, these are Joop and uh, Majolein, they're helping out to setting up the pots because uh, uh, it was a big experiment, but also each pot had its, ins uh, its own spot because it was totally randomized. Uh, had to, to, to make sure that there are no influence from the outside world on the experiment. And this is how it looked like a couple of weeks later. And much to my surprise, uh, it just started to germinate, and not one, no, almost all seeds. And our uh, idea was that we were going to follow each germinated seed, day by day. Measure it, look if it survives, does it form leaves, um, will it die? So then we had a lot of seeds to follow every day. It was a huge amount of work. This experiment lasted for 50 days. I was happy when it finished. But it was a great success because we never thought that so much seeds would germinate. These are uh, the rye. They germinated already within 24 hours. So very fast. This is just after two, two days. You can see the roots. They will go into the soil. They penetrate it. And that's quite good of them because when this gets wet, well, it's not concrete, but it's quite tough. But the roots of plants are so strong that they can penetrate it. I don't know if you ever saw, but uh, if you go to asphalt outside, you sometimes can see plants growing through, eh? pushing through. They are that strong. And that's, that's very important because also in that perspective, it turned out to be a very tough soil. Here, lupin, a plant, again, on Martian soil simulant. Uh, that was one of the wild plants, but of course you can eat the seeds. And since you're going to be a vegetarian on Mars, that's my idea at the moment, and that's most efficient. Um, oh, you will need plants like this for uh, nutrition, uh, to get a balanced diet. And then, 5th of May, everybody in Wageningen was celebrating, uh, that's Liberation Day. I got special permission to go into the greenhouse because everything was locked down. Because the day before I saw some knobs in my garden crest and I thought, that's not a normal knob, that is not going to be a leaf. And yes, indeed, on the 5th of May, we had our first flowering plant. This is garden crest. And we had three uh, species afterwards that <laughs> also uh, produced flowers. And that's I Im very important because just growing plants is not enough. I want that next generation because I want seeds for the next generation, so I need flowers. Well, we got them. Uh, two species indeed produced, even in that first experiment, already seeds. And, um, well, we were in a very luxurious greenhouse, so it's totally sealed off from the outside world. So there are no pollinators in the greenhouse. So we did that ourselves with a brush. And uh, we pollinated the plants, so we brought pollen from one flower to the other to get the seeds, and we were successful. But that's not something you're going to do on Mars, so you will need bumblebees as well, I think, to do pollination. So I already needed seeds for plants, but now I also need bumblebees. And I already talked about bacteria as well. I need them as well. So from simple growing plants, it becomes more complicated. Yeah, I saw a lot of things about Martian soil. This is Sherlock, one of the wild plants. On moons all similar. We had many seeds germinating there as well. But this one was the only one who tried, tried to form flowers. 
um, many plants died after a couple of days or a couple of weeks on the moon soil simulant. I think that was due to that aluminium toxic, very difficult to water the plants and very tough soil to grow in. This one tried to, f to flower, but uh, the day after I took this uh, picture and this is the flower, well, almost it died as well. So it never got that far to that stage. Much more difficult. Then the second experiment. Uh, we learned some things from the first experiment. Yes, it's possible, but it's tough. And one of the ideas was you grow clovers and other crops and everything you don't eat, you put back in the soil. Because you manure the soil, you put nutrients in the soil, especially with the clovers if you have nitrogen binding bacteria in it. Well, uh, we didn't do that with our first harvest. It was way too valuable because we wanted to do all kinds of measurements on it. Instead of that, we took just ordinary grass, cut it in small pieces and mixed it through the soil. And that really worked. Peas, then in the second experiment, uh, grow. And you see here after two weeks, and then after a couple of weeks, even on the Martian soil, just adding by a little bit of organic matter totally changed the outcome of the experiment because this is the first radish we could harvest on moon soil simulant. Uh, we also had peas, um, we had tomatoes, uh, the first tomatoes ever. I think I have them on picture. Yes, on Mars soil simulant, nicely red. And well, you couldn't tell the difference from uh, our normal earth uh, tomatoes. I didn't taste them yet. Because I told you already, there were heavy metals in the soil, so we had to be careful. I didn't dare to taste them. Nobody believed me that I said I never tasted them, but I didn't dare to, because I wanted to know sure that it was safe to eat them. And then at the end of the experiment, we also had tomatoes on the moon soil simulant. We didn't see them during the whole experiment, because um, all the crops were growing through each other. So we didn't spot them until we harvested, but they were there. This was our biggest experiment, the third one. And this was because we knew how to grow the crops now. And we wanted to have as big a harvest as possible. So we manured this one also once a week, as if we also used the poo and the pee of the astronauts and put it back into the soil like Mark Watney did in the movie. And then we had potatoes, tomatoes, green beans, rucola also, and garden cress. You can find them outside here. Uh, in total, 10 crops. And that went so well that we had a huge harvest. And then we asked Rachel, I don't know, you're a bit too old for a checkpoint, I think. Uh, she does checkpoint, all kinds of stunts to check everything. She came to our greenhouse to taste the first radish. I told you already about the heavy metal, so then you take a test panel, of course. Someone who is daring and willing to taste. I did it myself as well. And the funny thing was, we cleaned the radishes very good because we knew the soil had heavy metals in them, so you don't want to eat it. And we cleaned them in this bucket. And then she eat them, and they were very spicy. Uh, especially on the moon soil, it tends to be a bit spicy. And the first thing she did, af uh, did after she ate it, she took some water out of the bucket with all the uh, material and all the soil in it. <laughs> so she actually eat some heavy metals, not from the radish. Because we're not going to just feed someone with uh, food that may be not safe to eat. We uh, checked it. Uh, we did analysis on it. Here you see an example. This is tomatoes grown on earth soil, moon soil simulant, and mars soil simulant. And uh, well, if you, for instance, look at lead, well, something funny happened because here you see 220 mic uh, micrograms per kilogram, and here is just 32. So it's not higher, it's lower. Of course, that's good, because then I know it's perfectly safe to eat. For This is, for, my, for me, a very welcome uh, result. Um, but 
what puzzled me was this, it was higher. This is normal potting soil we use now to compare. And uh, so the tomatoes grown on normal potting soil contain more lead than uh, if you grow uh, them on uh, desert soil from Arizona or uh, the soil from Hawaii. And uh, I'm also an ecologist, that's norm my normal work. And it learned me something, because it tells me how polluted uh, our earth already is, that if you take potting soil, there's already so much lead hey, that origina originated from the cars, especially in the past, that uh, are driving uh, past by here. Hey, that lead is spread everywhere from combustion engines. You even find it back in your potting soil and you find it back in your food. Now, not really to worry about it, although I think it should tell us something, because this is way below what is allowed. So it's perfectly safe to eat them. But this was a big surprise. And again, here you see that we learned something, although we were working on something on Mars, we learned something about Earth. Well, and when it was safe, then we had a big meal. We had the first Martian meal ever with the 10 crops. We had a very nice meal. It was like we were uh, eating in a, in a Michelin star restaurant. It was made by uh, the hotel uh, school in Wageningen. We did that together. The students made the meal. And of course, the press wanted to eat something as well. So a bit more about where we're working on now. This is what we're trying to achieve now, because plant growth, we know how to do that. But we want to have that agricultural cycle. And we want to make it sustainable. So what we need. Yeah, well, we need them as well, the astronauts, because I want to apply the feces of them, because they can be decomposed, for instance, by worms. And we did already a worm experiment. They will survive in the soil. Um, they will bring the organic matter, also the dead plant parts, into the soil. There it will be decomposed further by bacteria and by fungi. We need the bacteria binding nitrogen from the air and we need the bumblebees and not to forget the plants. And so that's the way how we try to make a cycle, the cycle complete so that it can be self-sustainable. And that's a lot more difficult than just growing plants. Actually, that's the easy part. Um, because will the bacteria survive? We're investigating at the moment and it looks fine especially the rhizobium bacteria. I already saw the bulbs they form in the roots. Um, but we don't want to bring the bacteria that make plants sick. But can the bacteria we, who we want, can they survive without the other bacteria? We don't know that yet. Be if they do, then it's quite easy, just bring them. But if we know a whole ecosystem of bacteria in the soil, then it becomes very complicated gives me a lot of work, which I like, but I'd la rather have it easy, because if it's easy and simple, less things can go wrong. And it's already difficult enough when you're on Mars. This is one of the worms. It survives and it makes nice burrows, so it does its work. It's from the experiment. And, yeah, if you start with four worms in a pot and you harvest at the end and look at it, and you find five worms, yeah, well, that can only mean one thing. <laughs> uh, we had offspring. And we were very happy with that because we know not only that the worms will survive, but that they even can give offspring. So in principle, they also can go on and live there for a longer period. Um, we don't know how they will react on lower, uh, lower gravity, by the way. And... Um, uh, someone a week ago suggested that we should test that on the ISS, and if I was interested. Well, what do you think? <laughs> of course I'm interested. Um, and uh, for the pollination, I want to bring bumblebees, not bees, because bees are more difficult to keep. And uh, e well, of one of the nice things of bumblebees is that they go in hibernation. So if you travel for half a year, you keep them in hibernation. And when you're there on Mars and you need them, then you, then you revive them and they will do their job. We know that because bumblebees uh, are used uh, in huge quantities in greenhouses in the Netherlands to pollinate uh, 
tomatoes, but also uh, all, all kinds of other crops. So we know it works, so we don't have to look into that. And this is my last slide, well, my four last. Um, when you go to Mars, you have to go somewhere, uh, not randomly. And um, we know a lot of, yeah, we have a lot of information about Mars. And what we did was take all the maps that are available uh, based on remote sensing data by satellites. Uh, and we put them together in a GIS system. Uh, a student of mine did that, Lina Schrug. And uh, we put them together and then we selected what would be the ideal spot, ideal spot to land. And we looked at soil conditions. So we rather have less than uh, a lot heavy metals. Uh, where is water? Um, we also looked at if there is a lot of radiation or less radiation. We also thought, well, maybe we have to look for some things uh, humans-like. So we included if there are caves nearby, for instance, where you could live in. Uh, and all those things were put together. And then you get a map like this, where um, the red colors give uh, a place where it's really unsuitable, where there are a lot of toxic uh, elements, for instance, or there is no water there, no ice. Uh, and the blue ones are the more uh, favorable spots. And as you can see, some of the landers that are in here as well, here's Viking, Viking 1, here's the Mars Pathfinder, here's the Opportunity, they landed at those kind of spots. But you can also see, for instance, the Phoenix that landed and the Mars 2 landed at totally different spots. And I can understand that because NASA and also ESA are interested in general in Mars and how the conditions are there. Uh, but we looked specifically where to land if you want to establish a small colony over there. And we pr produced this map. And this is my last one. Um, all this is funded by crowdfunding. Uh, only the first experiment, we had some money. Uh, these nice t-shirts, for instance, are available. That's why I'm wearing it, of course. I got some other stuff here as well. But um, up till now, only crowdfunding. And I'm very, very happy with the people that support us from all over the world. Thank you. So before we start, I, I would like to um, ask our panel to just briefly um, introduce themselves um, to you. Yeah, so um, hello everyone. My name is uh, Arthur. Um, I'm currently in my third year of uh, aerospace bachelors, um, although I've taken this year off from that. Um, at the moment, I'm very active within one of the dream teams that the TU Delft. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it, but the Delft Aerospace Rocket Engineering is one of the teams um, that currently aims to be the first student team to reach space. Um, by building rockets. Uh, and this year I'm the president of the society. Um, and next year I'll be one of the full-time engineers on, on the following project. Hello, uh, my name is Agata Mintos and uh, I'm studying here at Building Technology Track. Uh, I'm a co-founder of, uh, of a company called Space is More and we are working on projects related to space. I believe we all know who Vicar is by now. Okay. Um, uh, the fourth person in this panel is not me, it's, uh, it's you. Um, so if you want to get involved, if you want to ask questions, or maybe we'll ask you some questions, just raise your hand, I'll come and find you with the microphone, um, so we can also um, use it for our recording. Um, a, a first question, perhaps, to our panel. Um, you've heard a little bit about Vicar's uh, research, and you've mentioned uh, what you're involved uh, um, in yourself. Um, how do you think you can benefit from each other? So maybe Arthur, you can go first. As a rocket scientist, how can you help Vika or how can he help you? Yeah, so obviously um, a large part of uh, Vika's research necessitates the UK. Uh, okay. <coughs> no, um, so obviously uh, a large part of the research might, might need um, uh, the, the, <coughs> the research in space itself um, as the, the whole situation where you, where you have no gravity um, is something that you can't accurately simulate on Earth. Um, and obviously the way we do that at the moment is by building rockets and, and take us to space and orbit around Earth or Moon uh, to do the research there. Um, and that is something that we really, really hope to work towards in the coming years. Uh, and obviously then in the future, <coughs> if you ever want to actually go to Mars, then you also need rockets. Uh, and that's really our, our area of research and our passion. Um, so I definitely think that's where 
the two areas can can coincide um, and uh, and work together to to achieve greater greater things. Uh, so I think that uh, it's all about the collaboration uh, to reach the space. So you you can't go to space focusing only on rockets or focusing only on growing plants or building uh, structures because it's all about the collaboration with everyone. Uh, so and it's about the circularity of plants, circularity of water. So <coughs> I think the future is to work in groups and big collaborations. You mentioned collaborations, um, Vicha. If I ask you, what do you think um, such a collaboration might might look like? What would you like to um, to see? Oh, you've given up <coughs> your microphone. Yeah, all of us you hear me coughing. Yes, I'm very into uh, collaboration. Uh, for instance. I would love, if you have your rocket, I would love to put a plant in it and to see what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah that's one of the things I would really like to test. And I know, Akata, you're working on, uh, in, a, in a, um, a hub, a habitat that uh, resembles uh, what's going to be on Mars or Moon. And uh, one of the things, of course, there is trying to get your own food over there. And I think, yes, working together, please, yes. Excellent. That's really good to hear. Perhaps after after we've had our little discussion here, you can continue uh, the conversation. Yeah. Um, at this point, um, you've you've had the whole presentation. Um, it'd be nice to have a question from the audience for any of the uh, panel here. So thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering uh, right now you're only planting plants, but are you also considering planting trees and see how the apples and pears and all kind of stuff is mm -hmm. going to? Uh, have to do a lot of running. Yes, it's good for your condition. Um, yes, and um, um, because uh, we're especially looking in uh, crops that can have the highest uh, yield. Uh, of course, because space is valuable also over there. Uh, potatoes are the key factor over there, but some uh, tree, uh, trees can have a huge uh, crop production per square meter. The only trouble is that you have to wait for at least well, normally 10 to 20 years. It can go quicker nowadays uh, before you have that harvest. So it's a bit complicated. But um, also related to this is that we're looking into citrus fruit because uh, I already talked about the radiation problem. And um, if you eat a uh, uh, sinusapple and orange, yes, thank you, uh, an orange, that will protect you from uh, uh, radiation poisoning because uh, there's a lot of vitamin E and vitamin C in uh, uh, oranges. And um, by that, you can um, do something about your health even, even though if you have a lot of uh, radiation. Yes, so we're looking into that. Not at the moment, although I had one apple tree from the clock house <laughs> when they, they planted one on Martian soil, uh, but it died, unfortunately. Um, one of the funny things is that um, on Earth, trees, uh, the highest trees, are limited by gravity. And they can grow up to 120 meters, and that is as high as they can get, because um, gravity pulls on the water. So it pulls in the other direction, and then if it is higher, there can be no water in the leaves, if it is higher. On Mars, there's only one-third gravity, so I'm dreaming of trees that are three, four hundred meters high. Thank you. Um, perhaps a question from our panel for Vika, because you've, all, you've both got your own expertise. Um, I'm, I'm very curious to, to know what, what you would like to hear from Vika. Yeah, so one of the um, questions I would have is, because uh, currently we don't have to deal with a lot of moral um, and ethical questions regarding going to space and colonizing space, since we are a student team that barely is able to reach space at the moment. So the question yeah. doesn't really pose itself at the moment. Uh, but I can, I can imagine for us that in the future we'll have to make sure, force ourselves to ask ourselves these questions when we deal uh, with situations that require it. Um, how often do you um, think uh, or talk about these issues with your colleagues, for example, um, or think about these moral and ethical issues of colonizing space? Because I can imagine this research is something you could theoretically do without posing those questions. Well, um, never. <laughs> uh, uh, I have 
<clears throat> I have to bring it up myself. And uh, that's the same with journalists, for instance. They never come up with that question. And I think, uh, well, for me it's fine because I know what I want and my, my answer is yes, we should do it. But uh, I don't think I have uh, a saying alone in that. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's funny, I think, that you never hear anybody about it. And I think these ethical questions have to be answered as well, especially regarding Mars, especially when we find, if we find life there. Yeah, how, how should we deal with that? It's totally unknown territory. Because in the, in the preparations, in the preparations uh, even now? Yeah? Okay, okay. You were talking about that, and I found it very interesting that uh, you said if we find traces of life on Mars, it's going to ha mean a lot of thing, uh, things, especially also in the field of religion, for example. Can you tell something about that? What do you think will be the effect of that? That's oh. interesting, <laughs> talking about that. If you can just hold the microphone up to you. And then talk in pieces. Let's see if that works. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that works. Um, yeah. Um, yes, we've talked about that. Um, I think if we would find life outside Earth, that would impact us emo enormously. And I know some religions uh, have, for instance, the idea that we are really alone uh, here. And if we would find intelligent life, I would think, but I'm not a religious person, but it would affect the way they have to look at themselves and at their religion. Uh, if you think that you're the only one, yeah, that will affect, yeah, have a huge effect, but also on me, if we would find life outside Earth, yeah, it would be in, an enormous thing, I think. It would be the uh, discovery of this century and me maybe even longer because that would prove that life outside Earth is possible. And if it is possible on already the next planet, then, uh, well, there's a bigger reason to assume that it is also possible on many other planets outside our solar system. And that we are not alone. Then, of course, is the big question, why haven't we seen anybody yet or heard, f heard from them? Um, yeah, it would have huge impact, but also I think how we treat Mars, if there would be life there, um, how do we deal with that? Uh, don't we go or, yeah, put we go, do we go there and, yeah, put it in a, a in a zoo or uh, something like that. Uh, we humans don't have a very good reputation on dealing with these kind of things. So, yeah, a lot of ethical questions then. Um, I'm not very afraid of that. Uh, it also often pops up if you go over there, you bring bacteria or you bring your own DNA or whatever, that uh, do you still know if it is earthbound or is it from Mars originally, because um, maybe it has the same uh, same building part, so it's organic. But um, since we have uh, millions, billions of years of evolution, I think you will immediately recognize that it is something out of Earth, because everything on Earth is connected to each other. We have all the same kind of DNA. I cannot see that that would be the same on alien life, because yeah, it may look like the same, but it will be totally different. So you would see immediately, if you look at it, that it is alien yeah, life or former life. Coming back to Arthur's question, um, do you feel that you've um, heard your answer? And also the question then to you, um, how often uh, in the, the dream team, the dare team, uh, do you actually uh, discuss these things? Do, you don't have to yet, but as you said so yourself, um, it's better to have these discussions in advance um, uh, uh, rather than afterwards when it may be too late. Yeah, well, we don't have them um, in connection to our actual project. Uh, so we don't discuss the ethical or moral issues uh, related to our actual project because there is not many at the moment. Um, and if you start to look, for example, at environmental issues, uh, it starts to become very complicated for us to do. Uh, I'm not yet at that level of technical uh, re level of readiness. Um, but we're all passionate about space and everything. Uh, so when we're at home and we're just having a drink with friends, 
uh, it's the subject that most often comes up. Uh, and that's just pure out of, out of passion and interest that we just discuss these matters. Um, but we don't have to deal with them in our actual project yet. So uh, we often talk about them, but not. So basically, um, if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, most of, of your team would be perfectly happy to consider sending one of Vika's um, plants into space. Oh, excellent. Um, who, who here is actually hoping that we'll find life on, on Mars? Are there people here who, who rather hope that we won't? I'm not necessarily asking for the religious viewpoint here, but is, is, is anyone excited about perhaps finding life on Mars? Anyone wants to chime in? I've got that. Yeah. Well, I think it would be very exciting because if we already found life here, I think people are more motivated to look at elsewhere. And I think, well, the whole space generation is, yeah, everything is just like boomed up mm. even more. I think in addition to that, it could also potentially answer a lot of still open-ended questions about the origin of this multiverse, if, if you will, a different kind of species, maybe, I don't know, different DNA composition, and that will fill up a few more gaps in what, what to me at least remains a fairly open question, even from scientists, if I, if I hear that properly. I saw a video on YouTube once, and it said, um, well, it was backed by research, and said that finding life on Mars would be terrible news, uh, as in finding former life on Mars, because it means that life is so common in the universe, but uh, at the same time, we've not been visited by any high-level uh, alien technology or alien civilization, which means that there's a very high chance of life being born, but also a very high chance of life being destroyed before it becomes really um, advanced. So that's a little uh, thought-provoking uh, nugget there. It also raises a question, which I think is also um, the, the, the tagline for the exhibition, um, the, the main question, um, whether we actually need to go to Mars and whether we, um, well, you were saying earlier, we probably will anyway. But we need to think about the fact, do we need to go there? And the question that was um, posed is, do we need to colonize Mars in order to survive as a species? Because as you eloquently put it, we've pretty much fucked up this place. Um, do we actually need to find um, other solutions? Who wants to chime in maybe on the panel or um, in the room? Uh, I'll start back at the back this time. Hi, first of all, uh, thank you for the lecture. It was very elucidating, it was very interesting. And um, well, I think the matter is, the question in hand is not actually, the answer is not actually, do we need to go? But I, I see it that it could be an opportunity for us to gain a new perspective on life and all, all aspects of society altogether. Because for example, through uh, evaluating how to grow food on Mars, we've already come to realize what's the importance of, well, we've known that for centuries, but what's the importance of pollinators, of symbiosis and bacteria. And we also took a look at the pollution levels on Earth and on Mars. So that brings a whole different outlook on our own life here on Earth, brings a reflection here. Very good point. And um, Akata, um, you're involved in research. In, um, because basically what you're saying is um, we're not only learning an awful lot, but we can also think, um, think about how not to fuck up Mars. And, and it's, it's a, another chance for us to, for us to get it right. Um, and Akata, um, you're involved in research into, into habitats and, and ways in which we could actually uh, live there. Um, any thoughts on this? Um, so I got interested in space and I'm studying building technology because I wanted to combine these two together to, so to survive in space we have to be sustainable, we have to have everything in circularity and that can help us here on Earth to, uh, to use the renewable energy better, to, yeah, to build the circularity in our houses and I think yeah, this is the... Mm -hmm. The combination. So, um, from from what you've seen so far, because um, if I understand correctly, um, you um, you have a facility, and you organise what you call missions, 
which basically means that people go in and live cut off from the world in this facility for a while and try and make do um, <coughs> not only um, perhaps growing uh, crops, but also uh, putting up with each other. Um, any advice you could give Wichach um, for how his um, Mars colony could um, thrive? Um, maybe a question. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, because I was wondering if we can't bring everything there, every living thing, and would the ecosystem would be limited, the logical, in, because here on Earth it's designed by nature, and there it will be designed by humans. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, do you do some research on that? Uh, yes, actually we are starting to do that, uh, to see which bacteria do we need and can they survive. So we're starting to build that very simple ecosystem. Uh, and I agree, we, well, no, we could not bring an uh, Earth ecosystem over there. That's way too complicated. But I hope that it's also not necessary. But uh, I think that, um, especially in the first time, the first period, so uh, let's say the first five to ten years, we will most certainly also need uh, uh, all kind of equipment to support us living there as well. So we cannot rely only on the ecosystem, for instance, producing enough oxygen or producing enough food. So um, it will be a combination of both, I think, especially in the beginning. Uh, I, I would like to add something to what you said, um, uh, if, if that's allowed, yes. Um, uh, here on Earth, uh, I'm from Wageningen, so uh, we do a lot of research on uh, how to grow crops. And what we especially see in the Netherlands at the moment is that uh, the uh, production is not going up anymore and that at some places it's going down, uh, especially here in the Netherlands. That's also due to how we treat our soils. And the soils are not healthy anymore. And what we do at the moment is also try to see how we build, could, should, could build and should build a healthy soil. And I hope that we also can learn something for agriculture here on Earth again, especially in the Netherlands for that, to, to revive the soils here in the Netherlands. Because we're getting problems at the moment. Well, you may have heard of it already in the news, but it's not only the pollinators, it's also in the soil. Are you aware of any projects currently going on um, res uh, doing that research, um, trying to um, get a bit of um, the Hawaiian volca volcano, or I can't remember which desert it was. Are there any initiatives underway? Uh, yes, there are several. Uh, I was involved in uh, one of them, uh, somewhere in the Middle East. But uh, if you look um, on uh, data from uh, remote sensing uh, from satellites on Earth, you can see in desert areas, you can see uh, round green areas in the middle of the desert. Oh, uh, and so they are already doing agriculture in the desert. But the problem is that they use historical water. So that has been there for, uh, we, we use it here as well, but we have a lot of water. We don't have much water over there and it's maybe 10,000 year years old. And um, that's not sustainable because when that's gone, then it stops. So maybe you have, uh, I know Saudi Arabia is doing it, but the estimate is that they will have for 100 years or so water, enough water to do this, and then it's gone. And so it that, 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 that's done on a large scale. And, um, well, there are some groups who want to do it differently and want to revive that ecosystem in a totally different way. And then you have to look at more than just growing crops uh, where we're busy, we're also looking at the weather and the weather patterns and they've changed and that's why it's become a desert and we want to change back that weather pattern as well. And how about Mars itself then? Because the, the water there is um, uh, very Ice. old and, and limited <laughs> and, and cold. Um, uh, would you not run into the same problem there? Uh, well, uh, my colony, my idea of a colony there over there is, uh, let's say, two to three hundred scientists and what comes with it. Um, so, there is a lot of ice on Mars, uh, in, down in, uh, underneath in the surface. So, I don't think we will run into that problem, but we could, of course, run into all kinds of problems over there if we don't uh, treat Mars as we should, because Mars will be very unforgiving. 
One, one mistake and you're gone. Any questions from the audience? So I was wondering, because so far you talked a lot about uh, research into the perfect conditions for earth plants. Um, have you ever considered turning it around and through GMA, etc., engineering a plan, especially for the soil? Um, I've had that <coughs> sorry. Uh, I've had had that question more often. Um, Wageningen could do that in principle, also in Leiden. Uh, I know in Leiden uh, they worked on the bacteria that can, bre can break down perchlorate. It's one of the toxic components uh, that's present in the Martian soil. They worked on that. Um, but my idea is that we now first work with what we have. So what we already have. But uh, I'm, I'm for originally, I'm a plant breeder, so I'm very in favor of uh, making varieties that are suited better than what we have here to grow on Martian soil. And that will happen, but I think maybe already on Earth, but it's easier to do it on Mars itself. And um, let's not forget I'm using a simulant. Uh, and all the research I do is on that simulant. So um, some things can still be different and some things we can only find out if we really go over there. And I think plant breeding should be one of them, yes. said before about finding something that probably is going to cause some problems, like the perichloride you were talking about. Yeah, that's yeah. what I said. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Um, two years ago, uh, one of the rovers uh, found perchlorate on Mars. We already knew that chloride was present uh, in the soil all over Mars. And chloride itself, hey, it's salt, basically, is already a problem if I want to grow uh, potatoes. Uh, well, they don't like that. We have now potatoes that can grow under these conditions, but it's very poor. So that already causes a problem. At the moment, we have an experiment uh, where we use uh, uh, sea lavender and um, uh, salicornia. Sorry, I forgot about the English name. Uh, that grow on salt plains. And we want to use them to get the chloride out of the soil you can eat them, it's nice, it's spicy, and if you do that and you remove uh, that way the chloride from the soil, then you can grow your potatoes. So, but that's not the biggest problem. Perchlorate is the biggest problem, and I can break that down with bacteria, but perchlorate, it's ClO4, it's very toxic, also for plants, but also for humans. It's, uh, it's a very strong oxidizer, even the tires of the rovers get damaged because of it's, that it's there. Um, if humans would go outside, the suits would be, could become damaged. And if you go inside again, you have to be cleaned totally from it. Even if there's a small part still present, it can get into your lungs and dam do a lot of damage over there. So perchloride is a big, big problem. It's not in the soil. It's not in the soil that we use outside here because that would be way too dangerous, uh, and it's not included in our research yet. Yet, I must say, because I need a specialist to work with it. But maybe next year we're going to try. Uh, Leiden already tried because they had their bacteria, uh, and uh, they tried to break it down, but they were quite unsuccessful bit to my surprise, because uh, perchlorate also occurs in normal earth soil. But it's in very low quantities because bacteria immediately break it down. They like it because it's an electron acceptor. And uh, they use it in sep uh, instead of oxygen. So they can live in oxygen-free surroundings if there is perchlorate. Um, so in principle, it should be possible, but we haven't tested it. And this is one of the things, when the soils were made, this was not known. And maybe maybe even this evening, NASA will come with an announcement that they, they found something new and that uh, will cause a new problem for me. Well, and then I have to see how to solve it. Yes. Uh, yes, I have a question. So thank you for your presentation. Um, and uh, if you manage to grow plants on a uh, more soil, uh, what would be the impact of the of it? Like, uh, 
terraforming? You think mm. it would change? Yeah, I will repeat the question. Uh, um, we are able to grow plants. Uh, I've shown that. But we do that indoors. And uh, she asks about if it is possible to do that outdoors and to get to, to terraforming. Um, also a question asked many times. You see it in science fiction movies. I think on Mars it is impossible to go outdoors. I know Elon Musk thinks differently. Uh, he wants to uh, use some nukes and then uh, detonate them on Mars and then get uh, ice in the air and, and also in that way make air. But I think it's a stupid thing to do to ha you, you, because you radiate uh, Mars. So yeah, then you have air and you cannot live there for a very long period. And it's not sustain it's sustainable because Mars, and that's the biggest problem, Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. So what happens is that cosmic radiation uh, arrives at Mars, and if you have air and cosmic radiation, then uh, the air gets ionized, and then it's able to escape into space. And that's exactly what happened in the past. That is why Mars doesn't have an atmosphere anymore. It had it in the past, but it's gone. So if you want to do terraforming on Mars, in my opinion, you first need uh, a, magnetic, a magnetic shielding. And uh, the planet itself is never ever going to get it again because you need a, a liquid core for it, like Earth has. Um, so the all, only other option is to make it. And I came up with an idea, but that's really science fiction. Because Mars, uh, it's red, so it's basically rust. It has a lot of iron. I could imagine that you send a lot of robots to Mars, small ones, they take the iron oxide, they make iron of it, they make a huge magnet from pole to pole, then you put some currents to it, and then you get a magnetic field. That's the only way I can see that you can go to Mars and do terraforming. Look, that's one of our dream teams to, um, to start working on that. Yeah. Um, well, wait. Oh. Ah, yeah, that's a really good question. Yes, um, uh, she asked if the soil would change also indoors by just growing and growing and growing and growing crops. And yes, it does. And I have to be very careful with that because um, organic matter, when it's broken down, so basically when you do agriculture, it acidifies the soil. And when you acidify soils, especially the Martian soil, you get, can get into trouble because I have no problems now with uh, the uh, heavy metals that are present in the soil. But if the soil pH goes down, so you acidify it and it goes down to three or four, then it totally changes because then heavy metals can come into soil solution and then can enter the plants. And that's why I want to have a long-term term experiment to test this, what will happen, because I don't want those uh, heavy metals in my plants and not even in the soil solution. There is of course a solution, because that's something farmers do also outside here. Uh, you have to use chalk, sorry, <coughs> um, to use chalk uh, to get the, pi, the pH at the necessary level. And there is a lot of calcium and magnesium in Martian soil. So I'm not really afraid of it, but in term, it could happen. And that would change the soil in a way I don't want it. Um, and uh, Martian soil is now basically sand. Uh, we don't call it soil. Yeah, well, I call it so soil, but it's not. It's sand. And uh, if you want to have soil, which we want, then you have to add organic matter and you have to... Uh, build that soil and that may take years, even decades. It also took decades, hundreds of years here on earth to get a proper soil, to get good agricultural conditions. And that's also a way that I'm going to change the soil, but that's the way I want it. Yeah? Okay, we just have time for a few final questions or remarks. I'll go to our panel first. Yeah. Anything you want to yeah. ask before we go? Yeah. I do have a question, uh, maybe a bit more back to the the initial question of uh, whether we need to go to Mars or not. Um, 
Did you consciously choose to prioritize, because obviously your research could very well be applied to um, planetary conditions here on Earth as well, um, to solve a large amount of issues that we might have already with, uh, with agriculture. Uh, did you consciously choose to prioritize um, applying this research to Mars over, over applying it to Earth, um, and why? Um, yes, uh, we, we started really with the idea that we were going to do something for Mars, and that's also, uh, and for the Moon, of course, and not for Earth, uh, yes. Uh, and that has to do with uh, how this uh, started, um, well, shortly. Uh, uh, my hobby is astronomy and science fiction, and already as a, a little child I read everything in the library about astronomy. Uh, I wanted to be an astronomer, not an ecologist, uh, there back then. Um, and uh, at the world we had a small amount of money available every year for very special, extraordinary research. I tried several times and never got it because they said it's not innovative enough. And then I thought I will combine my hobby with my knowledge about plant species and I'll write a proposal to see if we could grow plants on Mars and Moon. So, yes, it was consciously. And later on, I saw the opportunities for Earth. And the farther we get into this experiment, the more I see and the more I learn and I see that it's also applicable for Earth. Nagata, do you have a final question for Wiege? Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask what do you think about the privatization of uh, space industry? We have a lot of private companies that uh, want to go to Mars, so it's, it's not that NASA and ESA is the main one, or maybe it still is, but... Um, ESA not. <laughs> uh, so what will be, what could be their goal, because it's all about the money at the beginning. Mm -hmm. to, like you have to find some fundings to go there. So now it, it was the res, uh, research and the data at the beginning, and then in the future it might be resources or or we have to leave the earth. But what do you think? Like what mm -hmm. will be the, your goal? Yeah, or well, is it better? Or yeah, first of all, I'm very happy with the private companies. Uh, also because uh, NASA doesn't fund any research outside the states that's forbidden by law. Uh, so they cannot fun fund my research. So I'm very happy if someone else can. Um, well, that's uh, of course a bit of a strange reason, but I'm very in favor of it. Uh, you can see that uh, NASA and also ESA uh, have many, 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 and even more regulations. And that makes them very, very slow. And uh, they are always, especially NASA, but also ESA, influenced by politicians. You can see that with NASA at the moment. Although they're not doing what Trump is saying, because in the end, the, co the Congress uh, is in charge of the budget, but still. Um, so it's also politics, ESA and NASA, a lot. And uh, private companies don't have that. You can see that what Elon Musk is now doing He's not talking, not discussing, he's doing. And I think that helps and he has achieved a lot already in a very short period. So I'm very in favor that this happens. And I think that's the way forward at the moment, that private companies now take over, that they can earn some money in it, and that we see much more activity and that much more is going to happen. And I could imagine that the first Mars mission is not financed by NASA or ESA, but by private companies and that they will bring us to Mars. It's also a danger, of course, because there's less regulation. And you have to be a bit careful because what are they going to do? Are they going to mine? Um, are there going to be conflicts? Uh, because, well, I want to mine there as well where you're mining. Um, so I see it as a step forward. It's a logical step forward, but also you have to be careful there. So. How about you? Do you agree with Wieger that privatization is the way forward? I'm not sure about the long term, um, but right now the, I'm in favor indeed. Uh, the thing is, you can go much further if you have commercial um, <coughs> motive behind it. And that's the reason why NASA has a hard time getting funding, is because for companies there's little financial return yeah. into what they do, whereas SpaceX has clear financial uh, return into their projects and everything. 
Uh, so right now, indeed, to get that initial um, movement going uh, is definitely the way forward. Um, although I'm not sure if it's what we should do on the long term, uh, but it's very hard to speculate on that, so I wouldn't be able to say. Yeah, I would go for a combination of both. Yeah. Is there a final remark from the audience? In which case, I would like to... Um, oh, sorry. Well, yeah, I, saw, <coughs> I saw the question. We talked a lot about um, the, how the soul of the soul... But how do you think uh, the gravity will affect your eventually your vegetables and your fruits? I know it's, it's a hard question, but <laughs> your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a very important question as well. And um, mm, well, we could talk an hour about that. Um, I think, and there's a lot of discussion about this, eh, and we don't know. But I think, in the end, the plants will grow faster and they will grow higher. Um, there is some reasons. Yeah, that that this shouldn't happen, and it has to do with uh, the diffu diffusion and the uh, speed that the air uh, exchange will be in the plants. Uh, I talked about this with chemists in Utrecht, and they said, well, chemically there is no problem because there is no gravity term in any chemical uh, formula. So there, there should be no problem. But the gas exchange may be influenced. And I'm still hoping of three to five hundred meter high trees. But if you, you just said you need the due to the gravity, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. But if they are continuously growing, are they also still producing vegetables instead of only being? Yes, uh, the height growth is influenced, but uh, that the plant grows uh, crops. So, for instance, tomatoes or so is not influenced by gravity. That's totally uh, ruled by uh, hormones. Uh, so I don't think that will be influenced. And please, a final round of applause for, uh, for our speaker.